Hello, and welcome to the Screen Composer Studio, a podcast about the musical storytellers behind some of your favorite films, shows, video games, and more. I'm your host, Adrian Ellis. Suad Bushnak has long struggled to answer the question, where's home, in simple terms. The Jordanian-Canadian composer and polymath with Bosnian, Syrian, and Palestinian roots grew up in Amman, studied in Damascus and Montreal, spent time in North Carolina, and now makes her home in Toronto. Her work reflects her experiences and travels as she explores Western and Middle Eastern musical traditions and some of the places she's lived both in times of war and peace. She now splits her time between concert music commissions and her work as a film composer. We discuss that dichotomy, how she balances being an artist and a craftsperson, her perspectives on studying in Syria and Canada, traditions of Middle Eastern music, and what changed for her during the pandemic. The Hollywood Music and Media Award winner, who Hans Zimmer himself has referred to as an incredible artist, also talks about some of her biggest challenges, including the score for a demanding film that she worked on for almost four years. The project concluded with a set of international recording sessions that saw strings captured in Damascus between bombings, while others tracked at Aradell in London, North Carolina, and Toronto. A mentor once told her to never second-guess her gut instinct, and now Suad is making a home in music that is truly her own. If you like what you hear, please consider giving us a rating and sharing the episodes with your friends and followers. It really helps us grow and share the stories of these amazing creators. And now, please get your passport ready as we cross many creative and cultural borders with Suad Bushnak. Suad, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Adrian. Uh, to start off with, I want to tell you about something that I listened to because I think it relates to your story and um, potentially the way you see the world. Uh, and it was a very interesting podcast I listened to on the uh, TED um, Daily Podcasts. And uh, it was a cognitive scientist by the name of Lara Borod- uh, Boroditsky. Boroditsky? Yeah. And she's, uh, she's interested in studies languages. Um, how many languages do you think, first of all, there are in the world? Just as a wild guess. Hmm. Uh, I would say 800. There are 7,000 languages spoken in the world. I'm but apparently off. we're also losing, <laughs> uh, we're losing hundreds by, you know, the month or something is a very high number. In any case, one of the interesting, like her whole thesis with this talk was the idea that language actually shapes our world. Our perception of the world and how we see the world is shaped by how we speak Uh, It is shaped by language. It is shaped by the words we use and how those words create uh, stories and images in our mind. So she gives a couple of really cool examples. Uh, An Aboriginal community in Australia, these people from the very earliest age, like, uh, you know, toddlers, or maybe not toddlers, but young, young people know the cardinal directions. So if you put, like she was saying, there was in the theater, like, do you know where North is? And no one in the theater knew. He said, this person from this community would absolutely know where North is. And they know it at all times. In fact, they orient their entire world based on that. So if it's like, if you're saying, can you pass me or can you uh, go get that thing that's over there on the right? They'd say, can you go get that thing that's over there north, northeast? Um, The other example that was really interesting was this idea of like how we talk about events, right? So we would give this example. English speakers would say, uh, I I, I was uh, skiing last week and I broke my arm. Uh, French uh, speakers, Spanish speakers would look at you like you're crazy. Like, why would you go and break your own arm? That's yeah. insane. Uh, yeah. Your arm was broken what, and during a skiing accident. Um, they showed people a picture of someone, uh, of a person and a vase being dropped on the floor and the vase is shattered. English speakers go, she broke the vase or he broke the vase. And other speakers go, the vase was broken or the vase is broken. So there's this yeah. weird sort of like, uh, fault or a guilt uh, associated with this way of speaking. So the reason I'm sort of bringing this up and the, why I wanted to start this way is because you are someone who has lived in many different places. You speak a lot of different languages. And I'm so curious as to know whether this rings true. Like, what are your thoughts when I'm talking about that? Like, what, what do you, what do you sort of like, what, what comes to mind? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for me, languages are a big passion of mine. And if I were to live a second lifetime or a third lifetime, I would learn way more than I already have learned. Um, And I'm raising a multilingual child right now because I speak to my child in Arabic. He learns English in school. Uh, His dad speaks to him in Finnish. And Hmm. I do want him to also speak French, Spanish. I speak French and Spanish as well. So, 
for me, languages have always fascinated me because absolutely they are a window into other cultures and the way the words are ordered in a sentence, you know, the syntax of a sentence says a lot about uh, its people. Mm -hmm. And there are words that cannot be translated properly from one language to another. In Arabic, for example, we have so many different words that express love based on how deep that love is. Oh, wow. And yeah. these are words that have been used in poetry and each one of them refers to a different type of love in a deeper place in your heart. Um, you know, for me, Spanish, I learned Spanish uh, when I was doing my music degree at McGill, actually. Uh, I took Spanish as a minor. And for me, it was fascinating because it's very similar to Arabic. There is the influence from the Moors uh, on Spanish. They have at least 40,000 words that come directly from Arabic. But what fascinated me more was how a lot of um, sentences in Spanish sound a bit aggressive the way <laughs> Arabic slang is. Right. Like it's, it's impossible it, how, how similar they are and how... Um, you know, for example, in Spanish, instead of saying sure or certainly, you would say claro, which directly means clear. Yeah. But imagine saying that in English. Imagine if you told me like, hey, Suad, uh, you know, I did so and so and I tell you, oh, clear, like yeah. clearly. <laughs> it, it would sound very aggressive. So, yeah, for me, languages were an extension of... Uh, you know, me learning music as well. There's something musical about languages and the way um, they sit in your ear. I love guessing languages too. Mm. Even if I don't mm -hmm. speak them, I'm like, I can, Russian, I can recognize right away, but I love guessing like, is this Polish? Is it Serbian? Is it yeah. more Nordic, like Finnish, Swedish? Is it... It's it's super interesting and very, very musical. It's yeah. amazing how musical languages are. When we're talking about music itself, I mean, music, they say, is a language. And that's sort of true, I guess, depending on how specific you want to get with it. Uh, there is certainly um, different musical languages spoken around the world. And I wonder if you find there's a relation between that and the actual languages. Is that context... Um, is that syntax, is that vocabulary question sort of similar amongst those things? Huh, interesting question. I mean, when you talk about Middle Eastern music, for example, um, it's hugely based on improvisation, but also it's very melodic and linear. Mm -hmm. And we have, you know, in Western music, you have major, minor, uh, you know, different types of minor scales. And then you have the modal system like Mixolydian, Lydian, all that. Um, in Middle Eastern music, and, and when I do say Middle Eastern, I'm combining like, you know, Iraq, Syria, Palestine, um, uh, sometimes Iran and Turkey. And I'm not a, I'm not really an expert, so I'm going to be very conservative in what I say. But what I do know is that we have at least 70 plus scales. So if you think of minor, major types of scales, and we call them maqam, which are pretty much closer to modes because they change based on which key they start on. And, mm. you know, you can mix and match one half of one maqam with the other half of another maqam. And not just that, but um, they do have quarter tones, obviously, and three quarter tones. And these differ in their exactitude on the nine comas based on which city you're from oh, so wow. yeah so like a half b flat from aleppo syria would be extremely different than that in you know uh, uh, that quarter tone a half flat is a quarter tone so that in aleppo syria would sound different wow. than in baghdad iraq and you need someone who really knows how to play middle eastern music and who has learned maqam to be able to tell the difference wow. one is a bit higher one is a bit lower 
it, 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 it's uh, I'm ashamed to say that uh, despite my Arab background and having lived in that part of the world for 18 years, I never really took the effort to study it. It's shameful. Um, it's part of growing up in a country that was colonized <laughs> by the Brits for so long. You become more interested in everything that's not Arab. And then you come to Canada and you're like, oh my God, like I had all that richness around yeah. me and I just ignored it, you know? Well, isn't it, I think that's so much being a kid, almost in any culture where you grow up and whether you leave or not, stay in the same place your whole life, you always go, I should have taken more advantage of the opportunities yeah. that I had. Yeah, totally. Oh, well, that's so fascinating. I'm I'm so interested always to hear music from different parts of the world and sort of catalog how they make me feel on an emotional level and to sort of recognize the sort of surprising ways that I react to them to try and disassociate uh, prior context. You know, I think we're sort of poisoned in the West when we hear, you know, as you put it, Middle Eastern music and we always associate it being, oh, well, it's talking about this place. It's sort of got this instant symbolic reference that we know from movies like, oh, now we're talking about Indiana Jones in this place, or now we're talking about this or that. Or it's like, you know, recently it's there's so many movies made about terrorism and it always ends up being where they got to tell you where it is, like as yeah. if we're stupid. <laughs> so unfortunately, it has this it has these this baggage it comes with it. But I've on a sort of pure level, I'm so fascinated to see like it makes me wonder if I see red, does other do other people see red the same red? Right. Like if I hear a certain piece of music and I hear those inflections, I hear those quarter tones and the microtonality and the different scales and everything, and I get a certain reaction from it, is that going to be vastly different than someone from that area? Yeah. Very interesting question, because also the word like to go back to language, the word terrorism, say it in North America and only one thing comes yep. to one's mind. It's right. some Arab or Muslim guy. Right. Like words become associated with specific people and specific places, even though the word is generic, right? Yeah. So uh, I would say one, one thing that's to answer your question is something that usually strikes me in a very annoying way <laughs> is how, for example, um, you would watch a movie that is set in, you know, Baghdad or Mosul or Damascus or whatever. And you hear a sitar, for example, in the right. score, that's that's not from that part of the world. That's Indian, you know? We don't even know how to play it. And it's a totally different scale system than what the Oud plays or the Qanun. So it, it strikes me how even in like big Hollywood films, that mistake is made. And just because something sounds, oh my God, it's so exotic, does not mean it comes from that part of the world, right? right. Like, yeah. there, there, I feel it's extremely important to do research uh, to, to, first of all, to honor, you know, the, the people who live there and their cultures and also to respect the audience who's listening and watching and not take them as people who don't understand that this is a completely different instrument from a completely different musical tradition, right? Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, so it, it, assuming that you would see red the same as peach, the same as terracotta, the same as burnt orange is a bit um, disrespectful to you. Because I am sure that even if you're someone who hasn't really been exposed so much, if I show you all these different colors and kind of explain each one to you, you will be able to. To, to tell them apart, mm -hmm. you know? I, I think we sometimes underestimate the intelligence of your average um, moviegoer or music listener. Right. But sometimes with just a little bit of education, you can really, you know, they can understand a lot more about what they're listening to. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I guess it's the same in, in sort of music genres. Uh, you know, if you're not induced into what you're supposed to listen for and what makes that music interesting, heavy metal or hip hop, uh, and you don't have a relationship with it, you're going to be like, well, that's annoying. Where's the melody? Yeah. Or that's really aggressive and horrible sound. It's just noise. And anyone who knows will be like, no, you're missing like 99% of what's going on. Yes, absolutely. It, there's a lot of beauty in everything we hear. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it does 
you know, pass us by as just noise if we're not listening with intent and searching for that beauty in it. So you have a very interesting upbringing, uh, and it's very it's varied. It's not it's not one single thing. In fact, that sort of seems to be a through line in, in your whole life that it's never it's never a, a single shade. It's multiple colors all the time. Can you tell us a little bit about where you were born, where you grew up, and who your parents were. Yeah, let me show you a little movie. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is what I usually tell people because, you know, it's such a simple question, but I thank yeah. you for kind of breaking it down. Uh, I'm born and raised in Amman, Jordan, uh, to a, a mom who's Syrian, fully Syrian from Damascus, and a father who's half Bosnian from Mostar and half uh, Palestinian from Nazareth. So... I grew up in Jordan as a Jordanian citizen, obviously. Uh, and then I went and studied music in the music conservatory in Damascus, Syria. And then I moved to Canada with my family in 2004, lived a bit in Kingston, then Montreal, then moved to the US for three years, and then came back to Toronto in 2017. <laughs> I mean, it must make you feel like you know, if someone say, well, where, where's home for you or, or where, where do you come from? It, it's a tough question to answer. It is a very tough question to answer because I truly never felt that I fully belonged to one place as, you know, as sad as it sounds, I'm not trying to do a sob story here, but you know, that feeling of belonging, you know, like I have Italian friends who go to Italy in the summer and it's like, yeah, you know, they, they can trace their entire lineage to that specific village in Italy and they go there and they belong. And with me, it's, it's like I, you know, Jordan for me is who I am because I spent my entire childhood there, my adolescence, my parents, people know them there. I have family there. Damascus for me was my coming of age. I went there as an 18 year old on my own. That's where my personality and musicality really grew. And then mm. Canada, I've been here for 17 years. I'm Canadian. But I came here when I was 22, so I'm still very Arab at heart. And the idea of home is so volatile and intangible for me. Ever since I was a child, I've never, like, I've heard of Bosnia and the specific city we come from, but I've never been there until summer 20, 2017 and discovered this entire history of my family there. In Damascus, I wasn't fully Syrian because people would catch my accent. And... Uh, Palestine, I never really lived there. I visited Nazareth as a child. And then again in 2019 with tears in my eyes, but I never really lived there either. So right. to avoid being, without being overly romantic, this is where music composition for me uh, was super important because that was my home, mm. my true home. It was a place where I can be everything I want to be, all these complex identities in one home that is not restricted to a specific place, a geographical location, and it travels with me and it's going to stay when I'm gone. And it's kind of like my true self, you know, mm. in a mm. metaphysical format. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's amazing. What was it like studying in Damascus? Huh. Um, I, I honestly say until today, it was the best four years of my life. Wow. Um, you know, a lot of people see that place as a war zone, unfortunately. I, I will tell you, for example, that when I graduated from uh, the Faculty of Music at, uh, at McGill University in 2009, uh, one of my prof professors had no idea where Syria was. Like, they've never heard of the country. Wow. So it's pretty... Uh, problematic when now everyone knows Syria because of the war, right? Right. Uh, for me, I lived there between 2000 and 2004, and it was amazing. We had jazz festivals in the old city of Damascus. This is a city that's 3,000 years old. It's one of the, if not the, the only surviving city that's that old. Wow. We used to have jazz festivals in the different courtyard homes, and, you know... I lived four years going to concerts at the Opera House and playing on a nine-foot Steinway 
for free because music education was free for those who earn it. So oh, wow. it was nice. And I made some of my best friends there whom I'm still in contact with and we still make music together. So oh, that's great. Yeah. Was it uh, what 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 was the system of learning based on? Is it was it sort of a mix of a different styles and different uh, modalities or was it very focused on one specific um, method of teaching and learning? What I can tell you is it was very Russian. So okay, right. our conservatory had uh, teachers and professors from the Moscow Conservatory and from the Ukraine. So it was extremely performance based, uh, instrumental performance. I did not study composition there mm. and uh, also theoretical. But um, I would say the main focus was on performance because uh, our performance exams were anxiety inducing, <laughs> to put it lightly, <laughs> yeah. which is why I knew performance is not for me. Like I thought I'm going to be a classical pianist and that was my dream along with being a composer until I got there and saw what the exams were like. You had to prepare half an hour of a program that spans Baroque, classical, romantic, contemporary, know it by heart, then play it in an exam that had at least 15 jury members and the exam was open to the public. So anyone who wanted to come and attend can also attend. So you have a jury and an audience. And my tests usually were at 8 a.m. in the morning. So yeah, let's just say <laughs> that was my uh, cue to really just become a composer because I have major stage fright and I didn't know it until these exams. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> They don't make it easy. I mean, that's a, that's a difference. You know, the joke I always say was close enough for rock and roll and coming from the, you know, the, the hardcore classical world uh, where there are no mistakes. No mistakes. <laughs> and believe it or not, Adrian, until today, if I were to go to a concert, say at U of T, okay, mm -hmm. or anywhere yeah. of a solo piano and oh. I'm in the audience... I'm going to get the jitters yeah. on behalf of the pianist. This oh, is yeah. how much solo piano in a theater scares me until today. So <laughs> it's I, nice to know your own fortes and kind of steer away th from things that make you anxious. Like, I think that's a good lesson <laughs> to learn in life. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, I, I agree. I, and I think I'm probably the same way. I like performing, but I like performing where the idea of uh, errors or or a stumble is an opportunity, you know, like an improvisation yeah. um, or doing things like this. I love I love little moments where you go, uh oh, OK, how do we pick this up? Let's get this back on track again. Yeah. So you know, my my alter ego would be a touring jazz pianist. Oh, with cool. like That would be my alter ego. Who, kn who knows? Maybe in a few decades, <laughs> I'll transform oh, that's into that person. Wow, person. really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. <laughs> but playing with a group, not on yeah. my own. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, neat. Where did the interest in, in doing music for film come from? I think it stemmed, well, let's see. It was a, a process. It wasn't a singular thing. Um, when I was 16, I started uh, listening to a lot of classical music and, you know, r from the Romantic age, mainly like Chopin, Rachmaninoff, post-Romantic, all that. And... Uh, I wasn't really one of the popular kids at school, so I wasn't the one going to parties and all that. I was, you know, mostly going back home, studying and getting, you know, A's on my tests. And then in my free time, I'm practicing the piano or listening to music. So I knew I wanted to become a composer when I noticed that I have way more fun improvising and writing than learning already existing pieces. However, and I knew I would want to do music for films because I was watching movies and, you know, kind of knowing that that's the, the direction I want to do. However, it was actually one specific moment uh, during my composition degree at McGill. Um, I took a course. It was an elective called Music in Film. And uh, one assignment was to analyze Gabriel Yared's score to um the talented mr ripley okay so we had to watch the film and then write a 10 page analysis of the score and i watched the film and as i i fell in love with the score but then as i was analyzing it you know theoretically and in terms of structure and how it's changing and how it's thematic i just knew 
first of all, I kind of realized that this is one of the strongest thematic scores I've ever heard. And then I just knew that I want to do music for film. This is something I really want to do. So it's that specific assignment for that film that kind of switched on that light in my head that, okay, this is what I want to do. I think you're the first person I've ever talked to or heard speak about this, where they say it was actually an analytical approach to the framework or the the actual uh, structure of a, of a film score, the thematic, uh, how the composer dealt with the themes, how the composer dealt with the narrative, that that was the thing that actually made you go, oh, this is interesting. Um, That's interesting because for me also, the way I tackle it is two things. That score has a lot of Baroque influences in it. And I'm a huge fan of Bach. Like he's my, you know, ride or die forever and ever. (laughs) I was a harpsichordist actually also. (laughs) In addition to being a pianist, I was a harpsichordist specifically because I love Bach. And until today, if there's anything I do play with my rusty fingers, because I haven't played in a while, it is Bach. And listening to Bach for me, is so it's like a brain orgasm basically because it's so architectural and mathematical and i'm a math mm. teacher too mm-hmm. in in part of my life i was a math teacher so for me it's that architecture of a fugue or a, a suite that really blows my mind and gabriel yared you, in that score in particular you can hear those influences So I think the reason I gravitated towards film scoring from that angle is the fact that I heard a little bit of Baroque or specifically Bach influences in that score. Uh, It was mathematical enough for me, for my brain. And it was like, oh my God, I can, you know, I can do film music while playing these nice mind games, you know, that's right. uh, where you can, you know, get influences from, from, you know, uh, music that I like and, you know, doing that thematic thing where you can change a theme through, va- through its different variations into completely different cues and still get that cohes- cohesive kind of um, character and identity to the, to the, to the film score. So, Yeah. I, it's funny how our brains work, but for me, it was that challenge and combination of my different passions that uh, that I found in that particular score that kind of right. ignited that desire to to do it for a living. So I have to ask now because you know you've detailed this so nicely in terms of your uh, attraction to that way of looking at music and structure. Do you have? a very formalized way of approaching your scores. Like when I'm, I'm curious as to how you start um, when you get uh, an assignment. Um, I'm ass- I mean, obviously you're going to have conversations with the director. You're going to figure out what their vision is. You're going to figure out how you're going to solve those problems. Then ultimately you're sat in front of the blank page and you have to come up with something and you have to look at it from the microscopic one scene to the macroscopic, the entire film, how it all hinges together, how the score moves through it, and how we invite the audience to understand things at a different level as we progress through that narrative. So I'm, I'm just curious if you if you have a, a process that you can share with us. I kind of wish I did have a process because I feel it's, you know, it's different with every film. Mm-hmm. But what I can tell you is that I've my process, regardless of what it is now, has evolved. Um, I come from the classical world and that means lots of notes and lots of structure and lots of harmony. And it took me a few films to realize a few films that I scored to realize that 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 doesn't always work because of its interference with the dialogue, you know, the picture, all that. So my approach used to be, you know, I would sit at my keyboard and improvise the melody and make it the backbone of the score. That was previously my approach. But with with time and the more films I scored, I realized that sometimes it's just literally sitting and looking at the picture and deciding which instrument you want and, you know, seeing the rhythm of the of the scene. And sometimes your choice of instrument in and of itself would um, influence what music you write. So I would say maybe my, the only thing that I kind of 
still do is deciding on a sound palette. I still do that, like a color palette for the film. I never approach a film before doing that. Mm. Um, because after seeing a cut, I kind of have an idea of what instruments I want to use, what sort of sound world I want. So my sound palette is my grounding um, or restrictive field where right. I can play. Yeah. And as you know, creativity flourishes under restriction, right? Absolutely, yeah. Um, it's fun to just be given a few ingredients and try to come up with something really creative with them. So yeah, I would say it's, it's really, it boils down to that. That's the common factor between all the films that I've worked on, but then the actual composing process can vary widely um, from film to film and from scene to scene in the same film. Some scenes are like pulling teeth, like you do, mm. you know, five, six revisions and you're still not there. Yeah. And others, you score them with on a first take, you know, no click, nothing, and it's perfect. So I feel the, <laughs> the best lesson I learned is how a well-rested brain is your biggest asset. Ever. Yeah, we were, we were talking about that uh, in our previous conversation that uh, rest recovery um, yeah, is sort of a vital part of the whole process. I yes. realize as you're talking now that I think I'm a words first person, um, meaning that when, I'm, uh, when I have a project, when I'm talking to my collaborators, when I'm reading a script, when I'm thinking about the, the uh, story, I'm thinking about words. I'm getting lots of words and lots of oh. images. And what I tend to do is I tend to write a lot of uh, words down, um, descriptive words. I, I write out my analysis of the of the film and what I think the themes are, how like the, what I think the sort of character arcs are, how things are interacting with one another. I have this whole sort of like a stage. I set a stage so that I know where is this going at any given moment. And then when I do a when I do a, a big chart of like where are we going, like when I have my spotting sheet, it's not. It's oftentimes the words describing what's happening and then all I have to do is turn those into music. Are you the sort of, are you the same or, or is it music first and then figuring out the structure once you have the music? For me, words is the words are the first thing I ask a director to give me. So mm -hmm. when a director sends a cut, I ask them for five to seven words or short phrases that describe the emotions they want the audience to come out of once they've watched the film. Wow. I love the idea that you're giving them a restriction on in terms of what they want five things. Yeah. That's great. Like, what's your film about? And what do you want your audience to get out of it? Is this an empowering film that yeah. leaves you hopeful and, you know, happy and a little bit depressed? Or is it, you know... Uh, a scary film that leaves you, you know, wondering who's going to kill you next, you know, whatever it is. But like just these words, they set the tone for for the tone of my cues, because one thing I learned also from scoring a film where the director wasn't really clear on the tone is that, you know, that could be a whirlwind of revisions. The tone is you, you cannot start a cue without knowing what the tone needs to be. Right. And then the sky is your limit. Yeah. Yeah. Having a, having someone who is not, who is unsure of their own work and you have to provide something that, uh, elevates, underlines, um, you know, elucidates in some way. You were like, well, if I don't know where to point the spotlight or how bright you want it, we've got a problem. <laughs> exactly. And as you know, you know, the same scene, music is so powerful that you can change an entire story based yeah. on the tone of this, the, the, the score you put under it. Right. Absolutely. I don't know. I, I used to give these uh, like master classes on film scoring for school kids and university mm -hmm. students. And there's a series of clips on YouTube that has pirate a, a clip from Pirates of the Caribbean scored in four different ways with yeah. four different tracks. And the whole story changes. Yeah. And there is a similar set from Lost in Translation. Same thing. Same scene for, you know, four times scored differently and right. it's a different film. So tone is so important and uh, directors love it when when I ask them for that. They It kind of also makes them remember why they made the film because as you know, directors approach us usually at the very end of their process, right? And they're already in a very busy time, you know, dealing with color correction, uh, 
you know, finessing the edits, all that. And in a way, when you ask that question, you're giving them a little breather to remember why did I make this film and what yeah. do I want people to feel when they watch it? Yeah. I'd love to talk a little bit about a film that you worked on called The Curve, because I think it sort of speaks to a lot of what we're talking about right now, this this struggle. I mean, when I when I look at what you went through to score that film, it feels like uh, easily, uh, you know, several degrees in film scoring smashed into a few years of of unbelievably difficult work and struggle. And um, yeah, I just love to tell us a little bit about the director, what their vision was, what the story was and what your approach ended up being. That film was, so it's a feature film that went to the Dubai Film Festival, which is uh, at the time it was the biggest film, f film festival in the Arab world. And I was so fortunate that my first ever film was a feature that went to the mm. cinema. I hadn't done any films before that. And that director kind of trusted me just based on, we became Facebook friends. He listened to my piano album and he just trusted me that I can score his feature. But it was a four year process. He sent me uh, a synopsis. I, I gave him demos based on the synopsis. The following year, he sent me a script. I you know, threw everything away, wrote a new score based on the script. And this is the stuff you do when you're starting out and you're not busy, by the way, but you're, <laughs> you know, you're passionate enough to yeah. do it. You want that foot in the door and you see someone who believes in you, so you, you do it. And then the following year, he sent a rough cut through everything. The minute I saw what the characters look like, the colors in the scene, all that, a whole new score came up. And the fourth year, we ended up really deciding where do we, what do we, what do we want the music to say? And we decided that the music will be very minimalist, like the score will be extremely minimalist and will only reflect the state of mind of the main protagonist. That will be the only um, usage of score in the right. film, which mm -hmm. is why we only have about seven to 10 minutes of music in an 80 minute feature. Right. And it was, it was one of those, um, ga not gambles, but the director, he passed away, unfortunately, two years ago, uh, tr tragically. And he really pushed to have me on the film. And, and this is why I owe him my entry to cinema. Um, but the thing is also for me, coming from my perspective, I was like, this is a film that will go to international festivals. And I didn't get paid well for it. It was, you know, usually films from that part of the world have limited budgets and it mm -hmm. was the first feature and all that. But I made it a point to record everything live. So I paid out of pocket because I was like, this is a score that will define who I am um, for years to come. And that was the best decision I ever made in my life. I mean, mm. I, it was an investment. I feel as composers and I feel a lot of upcoming composers sometimes forget that, that sometimes that we are producers at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. You know, I sometimes get paid really generously for projects that go nowhere right. or that aren't really my wheelhouse. And on the other hand, I still, until today, take projects that mean a lot to me and pay peanuts, but because I can afford doing that, right? So it becomes like, at the end of the day, everything evens out, right? And it becomes a strategy. Like, do I say no to this film that might, that, that's a beautiful film that I really wanna be associated with that will definitely go to great festivals just because it's not paying me fairly. No, like it's, we need to be, you know, smart with stuff like that and everything ends up paying off at the end. So for the curve, to make a long story short, we recorded <laughs> the music in three different continents, string, live strings in Damascus, oboe by the most wonderful Dom Kelly at Air Adele in London, uh, accordion by Tom Chesniak here in Toronto and Buzuki in North Carolina and uh, my dear friend and composer Tristan Cap Capacchioni mixed it in Banff and that score until today I get Instagram messages and emails saying how beautiful it is and how much people loved it so you know it, it has memories of the director for me uh, sad memories it has 
memories of this collaboration that happened across continents from people who had never met each other, yet somehow a cohesive score came out. And it's it's a special, you know, uh, kind of like a stepping stone in my in, in my career. That's an amazing story. I, I love I love every part about that, and I, I really agree with you in that uh, in your approach and that you're thinking about it strategically because I think that's the key part, right? It's not that you just take anything on. It's not that you just say yes to everything and take nothing or very little as payment. There has to be an outcome that you're seeing and it can sometimes be, no, this is an important story. It's not about fairness. They just don't have the money to pay more than they can. Uh, yeah. And there are good reasons to do this. Um, did, what, did you ever feel like quitting because it was such a long and arduous process? The director was very picky and demanding. Uh, you had to do so many revisions and throw things out and start over again. I never felt like quitting. I was worried he's going to give up on me. Okay. Like for me, it wasn't a question of me quitting. When I really want something, I'm going to do everything I can to get it. And it becomes more like, does he still believe that I can get it done, right? And uh, sometimes it boils down to one cue that you do right and it's they're sold. And in this case, it was uh, a cue called The Road to Janine, which he named, but he heard the melody and he's like, this is it. You, mm. you know what the film is about. Oh, wow. Um, it's, I mean, you don't quit, but you sometimes worry about... <laughs> I, I never worry about not doing the job right. By the way, if there's one thing in this life, I know I will always complete and complete it perfectly, at least up to my standards, is music. Mm. I can, I have zero guarantees on anything else in my life. I have zero, like, I don't know how my relationships are going to be. I can screw up a lot of things in life, you know cooking my child hopefully not but like relationships all that sorry cooking your child i hope no, no. not <laughs> <laughs> i should have used a comma <laughs> this is where commas come in handy i will repeat i uh, what i'm saying is i could screw up a lot of things in life yeah. i could screw up a dish i'm cooking i could hopefully not screw up raising my child hopefully sure. not again fingers crossed that never happens cuz i am trying my best um but the one thing I know I will never screw up is getting music done well and on mm. time. Mm -hmm. However, you need for the director or producer to believe that too. And unfortunately, we cannot control what people think or feel. And I have lost films because a producer did not believe in me, even if the director did. It happens. Uh, and yeah. you kind of live with that. Um, but this is why it's also very important to attach your name to important projects, projects that are aligned with your trajectory as a composer, whatever that trajectory is. If your trajectory is to do commercials, then make sure you're getting the best commercials. If mm -hmm. your trajectory is to be in indie cinema, films that go to festivals, make sure you're attached to the best films that speak to you, that you will actually enjoy scoring. And that way, slowly but surely, you build that uh, reputation in that specific niche. And it might be a few films that you do for no pay or very little pay at first, and you compensate through other projects, but eventually you become part of that circle, that clique that, that really trusts your work because they've heard it enough times in films that they watch for them to be like, yeah, I, I want to hire her because I heard her in so-and-so's film that screened at that festival. Mm -hmm. So again, it's we're running our own small business and we are investors and producers um, and strategy is extremely important. How you present yourself, what, what do you want to be known for in this industry? Decide yeah. what it is and make sure that's what people know you are. I love all of that, and I'm, I think it's really the the strategic thinking that you're on that's on display here is really interesting as well. And further to that, I want to talk a little bit about how you then you know you you're you're showing up, you're connecting with people, you're doing the best job that you could possibly do, uh, and you're doing it in in a way that uh, elevates everything. Uh, you're not cutting corners. You're going to the nth degree to make sure it's a really high value uh, outcome. 
Uh, and then you hope that the work speaks for itself. And sometimes it does. But I think ultimately it's also a mistake to think that you do something and then sit around and some and the phone will ring. You'd have to actively put yourself out there. So mm-hmm. I want to know what, how do you, how do you approach that idea? Because you were saying we're, we are small businesses and that's definitely true, I think. How do you approach the whole marketing side of thing? How do you think about that? So I know you're not a big fan of social media and <laughs> I respect that. Uh, for me, honestly, I use social media um, to to talk about the work that I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And let's be clear, I'm not a fan of false advertising or blowing things out of proportion or treating Facebook friends and Instagram followers as fans. Mm. Like I feel whenever that's, there's that sort of superiority, you you lose your authenticity and you become someone who's just a bit full of themselves and i would never want to be that person and that's not who not who i am but if you approach social media as this club where all your friends are hanging out there's editors there's filmmakers there's producers there's you know um actors fellow composers and songwriters promoting your work there in a in an amicable way basically speaking about what you've done and letting your work do the talking. So instead, like, don't talk a lot, but show, you know, show what you've done. I feel it goes a long way. Now, I do get hired a lot based on word of mouth and recommendations. That does happen. But I feel that I'm not fully established in my career yet to let go of the promotional marketing aspect. I still haven't worked on on a lot of films that I really want to work on. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of still going up that hill and I haven't reached my tipping point, you know, when things start to snowball on their own. Mm-hmm. And that tipping point varies from person to person because like I'm booked, I'm fully booked with projects, luckily, until the next few months. So it is kind of a tipping point, but it's not the tipping point that, that I want, you know, sure. there's, yeah. there's a bigger one that I'm kind of <laughs> waiting for. Yeah. So, you know, talk about the work that you did, show the work that you did, and just also trust that people who really believe in you and want to work with you will reach out. Right. Because the worst thing ever is to want to work with someone who doesn't want to work with you because that will be a toxic situation and mm-hmm. no one wants to get into. Right. So yeah. I think like a few years ago, I really was fixated on specific people I want to work with or specific projects. And now I'm like, you know what? No, I think I've, I, I think I do good work and people who know it are recommending my name and I've gotten work through that. And, um, you know, I want to work with my tribe. You also, you always want to work with people who are like-minded and these people tend to gravitate towards each other. Mm. Um, you know, when it's the right project, when it's the right fit, all that stuff. I also learned that you cannot land a project and not take it personally because it's a question of vision. You know, a director might really love your work, but have a completely different vision for their right. specific yeah. film. And it's yeah. okay. And yeah. you wish them well. And uh, you also promote their film, even if you didn't compose for it, because mm-hmm. at the end of the day, you know, um, we're all in this for the love of it. And a missed opportunity doesn't mean that the world is lacking opportunities. It just means that it wasn't the one for you. Yeah. It's actually a good thing. You should think of it as like, good, it wasn't the right fit. Uh, Yeah. I can move on to something else that will be. This podcast is brought to you by the Screen Composers Guild of Canada, celebrating its 40th year in 2020. The SCGC is a national association of professional music composers and producers for film, television, and media, whose mission includes promoting the music, status, and rights for film, television, and media composers in Canada. Special thanks to the SOCAN Foundation for financial support. For more information on the SCGC, please visit www.screencomposers.ca and follow us online at Screen Composers. And now back to our show. I like this idea of finding your tribe because I think it goes back to what we were talking about with language. If you're speaking in a language that other people resonate with, if you're saying things and showing up in a way that people go, oh, you're like me, we're similar. I think we'll be great to work together. 
is if you're authentic in the way that you're doing that, regardless of what the platform is, you're going to connect with those people. But if you try to put yourself forward as someone who's as something you're not, if you yeah. blow yourself up too much, if you're somehow, if you don't feel good about the way that you're putting yourself out there, it's it's not going to work, and you're going to find the wrong people. Uh, if, the, it's and, exactly like dating. Yeah. Honestly, it's like <laughs> dating. If you go in, as you said, if you go in putting a front, a fake front, or trying too hard, or or pretending you're someone who's not, and above all hoping that other person will like you yeah that's extremely toxic and detrimental to your own mental health so yeah what you said all of it is true you know you, you want to work with people who who understand the weirdness inside of your head and <laughs> that's right i you. think it's a good thing yeah and yeah. i'm actually becoming like very good friends with directors i worked with like we are on whatsapp friends we send texts and messages and talk about life and all that because you feel that you found again your tribe yeah people you share things other than music with and it's it's amazing that's great do you feel comfortable in uh, and i know it's been a while probably uh, in in-person networking situations are you someone who can work a room and and and, you know, move through the festival experience with great ease and panache. You know, what's funny. I used to have reception anxiety at festivals because okay. I, I used to think, especially at festivals where I did not have a film, okay. because when you have a film, you can go and, yeah. you know, your shoulder, your, your head is held up high. Yeah. You can be like, oh, you didn't come to our premiere. It was yesterday. Like you, you have that. Yeah, uh, you, you, you can you can say stuff like that, right? But going to a reception at a festival where you do not have a film and people are like, oh, what film are you with? And you're like, oh, not this year. Talk about imposter syndrome, exactly. like writ large. Yeah. And then as composers, we feel that we're going to network, right? Yeah. Like to, to throw that net. So I used to be the type of person who's anxious at receptions. I would never eat like I'd be starving at the end of the reception oh, no. because I'm too worried food would be stuck in my teeth or something. <laughs> I was like, yeah. And what I discovered is you never land work in a reception, mm. basically. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's not the place to to really land a job. Right. Yeah. So when the pandemic happened, um, I was getting offers from people whom I never met. And like, you know, I pitched on a Netflix show, someone just reached out and one of my good friends and I were saying like, wow, if we're able to do that sort of work and get opportunities while in our pajamas at home, <laughs> lounging on a couch, then how important are these receptions after all? Right. Really? Like they don't really count. They're just fluff, I feel. So my kind of approach now is next reception i'm gonna eat everything <laughs> i'm gonna <laughs> hang out by the buffet if someone wants to talk to me they can come talk to me and right. it kind of like made me more chill uh and i'm happy about that because yeah. yeah you know the other thing about networking of course is you know you can there's all sorts of different ways to um manage it even if you're a person who's nervous it doesn't like to talk about themselves you can always go and be helpful to others or just plain be curious and ask other people questions but inevitably, the uh, uh, uncomfortable and tough to answer question comes up, which is, what do you do? OK, that's that one's sort of easy. And then what does your music sound like? Yeah. And that's always <laughs> the most challenging and, and weird question to answer. And you always go, well, there's no there's no way to tell you that, um, you know, with, talking and, and about make... music is like dancing about architecture. Right. That's the saying. So, yeah. <laughs> so uh, speaking of the pandemic, uh, I know you mentioned that you uh, as probably has everyone struggled through it and, and met certain challenges with, you know, there, there's been ups and downs, of course, and, and some people have found new ways of looking at the world and, and the way they're moving through it. So I kind of wanted to hear what your story was in that regard. Yeah. So when the pandemic hit, um, I would like look at some of my friends who are so bored and making sourdough starters and whatever. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> I'm stuck with a f with two feature films and a short and a child who cannot go to daycare anymore. Oui. And I'm like, OK, what do I do now? So my child spends half uh, my son spends half his time with me and half his time with my ex-husband. So for me 
at, at the beginning, like the first week or two, when we remember when we thought it's going to be a two week thing. Yeah. yeah. So I thought, okay, I, I can keep on doing what I've been doing since my son was born, which is multitasking. Like he's in front of me. I play with him, whatever, but also my mind is cooking the next cue, thinking of the next opportunity. I've always been on overdrive. This is how mm. I've been forever since I can remember. Uh, but I discovered after the first week or two that it's it's not working. First of mm. all, he is growing up. He's no longer a newborn that you can just, you know, ca carry on you while you're doing your work. Like he's moving, he's walking, he's talking. He wants actual attention and wants a response. So that turned out to be completely not doable. Me doing work or thinking about work when he was with me. So my strategy out of pure necessity was that, okay, when, when he's with me, I'm not going to think about work and we are in a pandemic. So it's not like the deadlines are set in stone anymore, right? Like there's mixes are being pushed, all that. And when he's with his dad, then I'm going to kind of push forward and try to do as much work as I can. And something that started out as a necessity, as a strategy born out of necessity, was probably the best life decision I made in my life because I learned how to be present. I learned how to be fully present with my son when he's with me, not miss a single smile or a single giggle or, you know, learned how to look into his eyes and really know what color they are. And somehow, magically, the minute he was with his dad, I was filled with this incredible amount of creativity and inspiration. Oh, right. And I was way more efficient as a composer and with way more concentration now because I don't have that mom guilt that yeah. used to hover over me because I'm working while being a mom. Now it was like, I just spent three and a half days being super mom to my son. Now I can spend three and a half days being a super composer. And somehow music was writing in itself. I was scoring a feature film called Jasmine Road. It's some of the best music I've written. And it's, the score actually won an award at the Fine Arts Film Festival, best score award at the Fine Arts Film Festival in LA. So for me, it was a massive lesson in the importance of being present and in a way, work-life balance, which I'm still trying to get there, but just how, you know, you need to live life to its fullest in order to be creative to your full potential. And it doesn't work differently. It, you need to live life to be able to be creative. And this workaholic aspect of work, 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 and chasing every opportunity and, you know, dwelling on things you lost, I completely dropped that, like I shed it and it, it was a massive, um, a massive shift in the way I think. It reduced my anxiety about many things in life and yeah, it's one of the best decisions I made in life was to just be fully present in every moment I'm in. I had to write that down as you were talking though, you need to live your life fully. You know, this, this is such a, I think this is probably one of the most important messages um, for creative people who are also, you know, making their creativity, their work and their livelihood is that sitting in front of a computer trying to solve problems without a break uh, and grinding away for 16 to 20 hours is not a, is not a creative, you're, you're, you're going to run out of fuel. There's just absolutely no way to do it continuously without ever stepping away, without filling the tank with something else. And when you're talking about your relationship with your son and this idea of finding this intense, um, you know, focus for both of those things and being able to say, now I'm focused on this. Now I'm moving over here. And this is, by the way, why I wanted to quit social media for a time, because I found yeah. that that was, you know, something that was living in my brain rent free. And I was divided. My focus on my, and especially my energy was divided. But I also remember, you know, people talk a lot about uh, coming up. And whether you should have a music related job or whether you should have a job that has nothing to do with music, but just supports you while you're trying to do the work. I did that. Uh, I had a job that had nothing to do with my music and it was a full time nine to five. Yeah. I never, 
I never had a problem finding the energy or being creative from eight to three in the morning after that day job because I was starved every single day uh of being able to output and to be express some sort of creativity that by the time i got home i'm like this is all i've wanted to do all day long the energy and the creativity is always there uh so i think that's an incredibly important and really wonderful um uh insight that you have uh and i th- i hope that people really take that to heart that you know sitting there and forcing yourself to do stuff and thinking that your productivity in air quotes is somehow going to pay dividends without ever doing something and living an interesting life or being curious. Again, that's why coming back to this idea of like living lots of different places, being curious about language, being curious about culture, studying different things, being uh, living a life, being being curious. Living a life. And if we were to go back to your initial question on language, the word creativity comes from creation, right? And life is creation. There's Mm -hmm. an aspect of creation. You're dealing with creatures, children, your loved ones, animals, mountains, the sea, regardless of what you believe in, these are all creations of some higher order, right? Mm -hmm. And unless you are in constant contact with these creations, how do you expect yourself to be able to create? You cannot work from an empty with an empty battery right like you need Mm. to fill up your jug to be able to fill into other aspects of your life and this is why like for example if you travel to a film festival for example i went to the locarno film festival this past august Mm. i made sure i had days flanked on each side to see the city that I'm going to. Yes, I was there for networking. Yes, I was there for the premiere of a film that I scored, but I also went and swam in Lago Maggiore. I also went and explored Zurich. And it's like, you need to give yourself credit and fulfill your own passions, be them travel, be them home decor, woodworking, whatever it is, hobbies, you know, embrace them, don't feel guilty about them because that's exactly the time, as you said, with your full-time job, that's exactly the the time you come back to your music with that renewed love and a lot of ideas and inspiration and what you might end up spending seven hours trying to work if you had nothing else going into your life will be done in an hour if you Mm -hmm. actually lived your life and done what you had to do. Yeah. So it's this idea that you have to be a full-time composer with no life on the side <laughs> is obsolete, right? Yeah, I hope so. I hope it's becoming obsolete. I hope that in general, you know, I, I, I say this oftentimes when I'm working on something uh, that, you know, uh, might not necessarily be an important message or something that really, it's more like comfort food kind of stuff. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And when I'm working with people who really get it, they get what we're doing. And I always say to other people, you know, or they say, well, what's it like to work with these people? It's like, they know they're not curing cancer, you know? And I think that's so important. It's like, what are we doing here? Why are we showing up in general? There's, there isn't a movie in the world that's worth your health, uh, that's worth you ending up in the hospital, that's worth you destroying an important relationship in your life or or being absent in some way. So I, I'm, I'm hoping that, um, you know, these stories get shared more and more. And I think one of the interesting things about the pandemic is that mental health has become such an important central issue for everyone. And we're talking about it in a way now that doesn't sort of suggest that people who have challenges are in any way unique uh, or that that is somehow a stigma of any kind, because we all suffer mental health challenges at different times. And I think it's super important to look at it the same way you would look at someone who is a sprinter, who has an injured Achilles tendon. You don't go, oh, you're weak. Uh, you're just letting this thing that's in your head get to you. And it's like, no, literally this thing is snapped. I can't run. Yeah. You need rest. You need recovery. You need to have surgery. You need uh, interventions. You need good coaching. Yeah. So I love that message. I think that's really important. Never feel guilty for taking a midday nap, for example. Yes. Like naps are some of the best gifts that life has given us. Absolutely. And yet a lot of people, a lot of people feel guilty taking a nap. Yeah. Although in other cultures, Spain, a siesta is imposed, stores close. Yeah. You cannot do anything between two and four or two and five. <laughs> and then you wonder why they live longer. They look younger. They're happier despite yep. like having bad economics or whatever. 
it's it's prioritizing the joie de vivre you know the the love yeah. of life and you know working to live and not living to work which i yes. i feel is a it's a very north american mentality unfortunately that we get sucked into just by virtue of where we live and you're right after the pandemic there has been this awakening about no like i'm gonna take care of my mental health first my physical self and then I'll tackle work and yep. you know I stopped taking meetings at odd hours or <laughs> really I used to do that wake up at 3 a.m for a meeting that could have been easily scheduled for an right. another time and yeah. in a way once you respect yourself that's earned people start to respect the fact that you respect yourself yep. and your own well-being and yeah you're giving that message to people to do the same to their own selves as well. Absolutely. Yeah. I love it. I wanted to talk a bit about, you know, the, the other 50% of your creative life, which is concert uh, commissions and scoring. Um, because it's a, it's, I think the approach is different and the men mentality I'm assuming has to be different. And there's a whole other world. And I'm sure that both your film side and your concert music side inform each other. So I was hoping you could speak a bit to that. I love that comparison because I I tend to talk to it whenever like I'm talking to filmmakers. Um, basically, my so yes, I divide my time precisely 50 50 percent in each one of these fields. And uh, coming to the film world from a concert music background taught me a lot about ego and how egoistic concert composers can be. I'm one of them. That's <laughs> as a concert composer, ego plays a big part because you're okay. the star of the show. You're composing right. this work that's going to be performed by an orchestra and you have complete freedom to do whatever you want. I mean, you see people playing their instruments upside down for the sake of art, right? Mm -hmm. You technically have a license to do anything you want. And this is where I like, uh, you know, after reading Richard Bellis's book, The Emerging Film Composer, and learning about the idea of film composers being craftspeople and not artists, it's, it's a very important shift. So for me, I love the fact that I do concert music because that's where I can get all of this egoistic music musicality out of my system so if i have crazy <laughs> ideas or just you know i want to express my identity or whatever it is i can do it in concert music and no one can say anything mm -hmm. um and then when it comes to film music i've already gotten whatever i want to get out of my system in concert so now i come to film music approaching it from that craftsperson point of view from that team, you know, team member point of view, knowing that a lot of what I write can be butchered and chopped and that I might end up having to write one note under a scene. And it's OK, because that's what the scene needs. And it's not about me writing a memorable melody. Right. right. So yeah. I get to do tons of memorable mem melodies in concert. But then I come to film saying, you know, whatever suits the scene. And I like to make the analogy of say um say you hire a carpenter to to design a door for your house mm -hmm. and this carpenter comes and says i think i'm gonna give you an s-shaped door because that's what i feel like doing <laughs> and the lock will be from the top right corner and it's gonna open by like sliding downwards and i don't yeah. care who it's hits on its way down. I want to deconstruct the idea of what a door is. So exactly. you don't actually walk through the door. You can't get in your house anymore. Yeah. For example, <laughs> would you ever hire that carpenter right. ever again? You won't because that, that's a door that's meant to be put in a museum for people to admire as wow, artistic, different, pushes the limits, expresses the identity of the carpenter mm -hmm. whose name might start with the letter S and needs a door into his or her soul, right? That's a piece of art. You put it in a museum for people to admire, look at, take photos of. You will hire the car carpenter who gives you a door that suits your requirements and needs as someone who needs to walk into his house, right? Mm -hmm. It needs to be the color you want. It needs to suit your house, be the right size, the right height, easy to access. Anything you want in it needs to be there. And that's the difference between a concert composer and a film composer. 
it's really that difference of, of doing art. Um, I forgot the term, but there's a term given for art that serves a purpose. Forgot uh, the term. Artisanal or? Maybe artisanal. Craftsperson per, craft kind of approach. It's, yeah. yeah. So the or idea functional? in general, functional art. Exactly. Film music is functional art. It serves a specific purpose. And a that's the of, difference between a concert composer and a film composer. A lot of people these days, and you hear this advice given out a lot on panels or in, in talks or in books uh, about film composition, they say you should be an artist. Uh, you know, they're encouraging people to have a voice. They're encouraging people to sort of do things that's get, that get them noticed, that, to stand out. And yeah. you do see uh, people who are working in this space who have great success. Uh, Mika Levy comes to mind. I mean, her uh, score for Beneath the Skin is a touch point for a lot of horror movie. I, I can't. He, it's like the American beauty of horror scores. You know, every time I work with someone, they're like, oh, yeah, there's that great score by, um, you know, and I'm always like, oh, you're talking about Beneath. Like, they don't have to say, I know that's what they're going yeah. for. But, you know, you listen to that and you go, wow, what an interesting approach. You know, what a what a fantastic uh, voice. Um, what's your what's your thinking on that? Like, how how do you feel about that intersection between being an artist and having a point of view, being expressing some kind of a, an idea that is very much in your voice and still being able to work within the confines of the film world? I think these are, I think there are special cases. So sometimes you can definitely push the limits if the director is giving you that green card mm -hmm. if there's if the if the collaboration in and of itself is extremely artistic in the sense that we want you to do what you think is right and we want you to push your own limits and that would be a creative choice mm -hmm. so i think these things unless you're you know an a-list composer who can have that much say in, and even A-list composers, a lot of them do not have that much say because the reason they get hired over and over again is because of the trust they gain from their directors, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think this is a special case where maybe there was a conversation saying, push your limits, do something crazy. We're up for that. It needs to be agreed upon, in my opinion, or you can risk it and do it, but then if the director doesn't like it, you change it. When I say be a craftsperson, I'm not saying be boring. I'm not saying be conventional. I'm not saying repeat yourself, but mm -hmm. I'm saying put the film as your main, the storytelling in the film as your main goal, as something that you wanna enhance through the music and not something you wanna trample over. Um, and this has a ton of nuances, like where this starts and ends is extremely, it's not something tangible and it differs from project to project, right. composer to composer, director to director. Mm -hmm. But I strongly believe that it is impossible to be a successful film composer if every film that comes to you, you want to score it based on your own whims. Yeah. <laughs> you will not survive. You yeah. will not be hired again. You might keep getting hired by a specific people who want that craziness. But if you want to make this a career that you yeah. pay rent through and, yeah. you know, maybe get a mortgage or whatever, like a career that you actually live from, you cannot be a full artist in your head and be like, if, you know, the director doesn't like this, I'm not going to work. No, mm -hmm. you're, you're never going to get hired. It's you not your that, film. It's the director's film. You're there on a job to do, to be creative, but to serve the storytelling and serve the film. Right. Do you find that directors or film people have found you because of your concert music first and that that's been a boon to your, your work as a film composer? Um, not necessarily, actually. So those worlds um, are kind of, they're, they're, they're parallel, but they don't intersect very much. They're parallel. Yeah. So I, I don't uh, feature my concert music on my reels that I send to um, directors. There is one exception. There's a film that I, um, that I got to know of and ended up becoming part of during my, I did the Spot the Composer program at the Cannes Film Festival this past July. And a Bosnian director found me 
and we chatted and it's like she was my long lost friend wow. and I was the same to her. <laughs> and she actually ended up listening to one of my concert works, The Borrowed Dress, which is derived from a film score, by the way, but it was blown up for orchestra. And she, she started sending me pictures of her team members in tears because oh, they wow. loved it so much. But the reason she loved it is because there were Balkan influences in that particular piece that mm -hmm. really spoke to her. Mm -hmm. That's the one time I feel um, that my concert music kind of influenced um, a director. Usually they are parallel worlds. Um, I actually feel in most cases, I would want to avoid having directors listening to my concert work because I'm not working on big Hollywood blockbusters that require huge orchestral music. I'm working in indie cinema where you need to be very delicate. So I feel right. that if I hear my, if they hear my big orchestral works, it could actually turn them against me right. and be like, no, yeah. no, 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 you know, she's not the right fit. Yeah. You, you only work with 60 musicians, anything less you can't do. I, <laughs> yeah. I don't know how to write for solo violins. Yeah. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> and, uh, sorry, and especially also, especially with like film scores now, you need a lot of atmospheric elements, you know, hybrid and yeah. concert work never shows that aspect right. of your film yeah. scoring. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. So what are you working on now that's exciting? I'm uh, wrapping up a documentary for the National Film Board called Incorrigible uh, by Karen Lee. She's an award-winning uh, Canadian uh, filmmaker. And I'm starting a beautiful short, an animated short called Corvine, which is like one of the most beautiful shorts I've seen mm. in my life. Um, and there are a few other shorts in the horizon, as well as the Bosnian uh, hybrid documentary that um, is called Pour the Water as I Leave, which I'll be starting sometime in December. Very cool. And you've got a Vermont orchestra is working on something of yours as well, right? Yeah. So in the concert world, I was commissioned to write a cello concerto for the Vermont Symphony Orchestra. The world premiere is October 30th. Oh, amazing. And what's incredible about this orchestra is its outreach program. So basically, we are spearheading a composing competition called Master Clef, uh, targeted towards middle and high school students. Uh, the name is a play on MasterChef. So it's the <laughs> idea, if you think of MasterChef meets Chopped, yep. it's the idea of giving the same ingredients to, some, to, to six oh, or ten composers. Cool and asking them to come up with something completely unique. Right. And for Master Clef, we sent them the first five measures of my theme for the cello concerto. My cello concerto, the three movements are based on the same theme that I came up okay. with. Yeah. We gave them that theme and the idea is that they can turn it into anything they want in any genre between one and three minutes long, hip hop, uh you know rock edm whatever they want use that theme in a song or a piece of music that reflects who you are and the competition will be judged and we're going to have a master class with them prior to the concert that's super cool i love yeah. it you don't you certainly don't want to have a piece that starts with several held notes over many many bars for that one though. you have to have like <laughs> statement of the theme very interesting from the beginning yeah that's so cool where can people find you online and follow what you're doing uh, you can find me on my website, suadbushnak.com. I'm also on Instagram, music by Suada, S-U-A-G-A. And I'm on Facebook. Just look up Suad Bushnak. I'm not a Twitter person. I post once every three months. Do not go on Twitter. <laughs> do not, do not follow on me on Twitter. Uh, it's funny how people and have their the platforms. And for the love of God, do not follow me on LinkedIn because oh. I can barely pronounce that word and like... It's, it's completely outdated. So Instagram, <laughs> Music by Suada, Facebook, Suad Bushnak, and my website, suadbushnak.com. Brilliant. Well, I, normally I'd ask if you have any parting words, and you're certainly welcome to add some, but I think you've already given us so much uh, incredible perspective, and this has been a really fun conversation. So anything else that you want to add before we part ways? Huh. Yes. I would oh, say there, it's a quote that I once heard and I kind of wrote it down. There is enough room in the sky for all stars to shine. And the reason I love this quote is because 
uh, a lot of composers at the beginning of their career feel that that if, that if they lost an op opportunity or if an opportunity went to someone else, it means they ran out of opportunities. But if you think that, if you look up at the sky, you never say, oh my God, there's an extra star today. <laughs> it's way too bright. You never say that, right? So think of it in terms of opportunities. Everyone has an opportunity waiting for them and it's going to happen at the right time. I absolutely adore that. I think that's a fantastic way to end off. So Ada, thank you so much for taking the time. This has been super fun. Thank you for having me, Adrian. All right, we'll see you around. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this conversation, please consider showing your support by giving the show a five-star rating and sharing the episodes with your friends and followers. The Screen Composer Studio is produced by myself, Adrian Ellis. Graphics and post-production assistance by Nick Grimshaw. Special thanks to our managing director, Tanya Dedrick, as well as Charlie Finley, Elizabeth Hannon, and Guggen Singh for their support. For more information on the SCGC, please visit www.screencomposers.ca and follow us online at Screen Composers, or reach out at tscs at screencomposers.ca.